I kind of wish people would stop trying to define other people. I wish people would let people be who they are. But but I also think that the desire to define others stems from a desire to define yourself. If you can find the rules to a system, then you can find where you fit into the system. But I think as you get older, you realize that these rules don't really exist. You don't need to fit into these isolated boxes and you can be whoever you want, which means that everyone else can be whoever they want. This is The Book of Life, a show about Jewish kidlet, mostly. I'm Heidi Rabinowitz. Jewish identity can be complicated, especially for people who come from a mixed background. We are starting to see this reality acknowledged in middle grade and young adult fiction, with characters who are working to figure out what being Jewish means to them, or who are trying to better integrate the different parts of their heritage. For this episode, I've called together three authors whose novels explore this topic. Primrose Medeg Nazan, author of the YA novel Lessons in Fusion, and middle grade authors Amy Lucido, who wrote Recipe for Disaster, and Amanda Panich, who wrote The Two Wrong Halves of Ruby Taylor. Here is our virtual panel discussion, a walk on the Jewish side. Amy, Amanda, Primrose, welcome to the Book of Life. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. We're excited to be here. Yeah, thank you so much. So I'd like to ask each of you to tell us what your book is about and what inspired you to write it, just briefly. So let's start with Amanda. So my book is called The Two Wrong Halves of Ruby Taylor, and it's about a 12-year-old girl who is a patrilineal Jew. Her father is Jewish and her mother is Christian, and she was raised Jewish but she faces a lot of discrimination, not so much from her community, but from her grandmother, who feels that she isn't Jewish enough and doesn't belong in the community, even though Ruby has been raised as a Jew and feels very strongly that she is Jewish. The book follows her and her perfect cousin, Sarah, who is perfectly Jewish on both sides of her family. And when Sarah accidentally gets possessed by a Dibbuk, an evil spirit that possesses somebody in order to complete some task. Ruby's the only one who can stop her. But as it turns out, a dibbit can only be exercised by a pious Jew, quote unquote. And if Ruby isn't a pious Jew enough for her own grandmother, how can she possibly be Jewish enough to face the dibbit? So this is my second middle grade fantasy book. And the first one involved a golem. And so I just had a lot of fun playing around with the different creatures in Jewish mythology and setting them in our world. You can still say a lot about our world, even if all the elements aren't quite of our world. And so I really liked using that fantasy element and the element from our history in order to explore very contemporary issues. And I think the thing that especially grabbed me about the Dibbuk is because in all of the reading that I did and the research that I did, it specified that it needed to be a pious Jew, quote unquote, to be the one to expel the Dibbuk and rescue the person who is possessed. And so I knew that this book wanted to explore a character who wasn't quite sure in her identity. And so in reading that, I was thinking like, well, this is the conflict right there. Like she needs to be a pious Jew in order to save her cousin and expel the Dibbuk. But she, she needs to feel confident in herself and who she is in order to do that. There's a plot and the conflict right there. I am not a patrilineal Jew, but my family was mixed a little bit in that my father is ethnically Jewish, but he was not really raised Jewish. His family celebrated Christmas and didn't really celebrate any of the Jewish holidays or or take part in any Jewish culture. It was like my grandparents on that side were embarrassed to be Jewish. And so when my father married my mother, who is very strongly Jewish and identifies very strongly with the Jewish community, it distanced us a little bit from that side of the family. And my grandmother actually favored our cousins in kind of a reversal of the situation in the book, where my other uncle married a Christian woman, my cousins were Christian, and she very clearly and strongly favored them. And so this book kind of stemmed from those feelings. That's what inspired me to write Ruby and her, you know, her story of not quite fitting in on either side of the family. All right. Thank you, Amanda. Amy, tell us about your book. So my book, Recipe for Disaster, is about a 12, almost 13-year-old girl named Hannah Malfa Adler, who comes from a family that has a complicated Jewish background. Her mother was raised Jewish, but doesn't practice. Her father was raised Catholic, but doesn't practice. 
And Hannah kind of doesn't have much connection to either religion in her family, with the exception of the fact that her grandmother Mimi lives with them. And she identifies very strongly as Jewish. And so the only connection that Hannah has to any sort of family culture whatsoever is her grandma Mimi and also her best friend Shira, who just turned 13 and has a blowout bat mitzvah. Like it's, it's big, it's festive, it's expensive, it involves a dance with the boy that they both like. Um, and Hannah starts to get jealous. And so she decides that she's going to have a bat mitzvah too. The only problem is her parents and her grandmother can't agree on whether she's Jewish enough for one. And so Hannah decides to go behind everyone's back and give herself the bat mitzvah that she craves, although things do not go as planned. And this was very much inspired by my childhood. I was also raised in a very secular household that was half Jewish, half Catholic, but really nothing because we... We only kind of celebrated the fun holidays, if even that. I remember when I was 12 going on 13, I really, really wanted a bat mitzvah. And I felt like I deserved one or I, I, had, the, I had the right to have one because I was Jewish. Not really understanding kind of the work that went into having a bat mitzvah and the commitment that it required. I never ended up having a bat mitzvah. As I got older, I sort of thought of not having a bat mitzvah as kind of a thing that was preventing me from being Jewish. And so when people asked me if I was Jewish, I would say, well, I kind of am. My mom's Jewish, but I never had a bat mitzvah. And then as I got older and started to get more connected to my Jewish roots, I still kept coming back to the bat mitzvah thing, which at some point started to feel kind of silly. Like, you know, I, I was the one out of all my friends that were Jewish that all had a bat mitzvah that was that was keeping Passover like everyone would come to my house for Passover. I was the one that was getting us to fast on Yom Kippur. I was hosting Rosh Hashanah parties and all, you know, all these things. And so I was like, well, why am I so stuck on this thing? The book really came as a, an exploration of what is a bat mitzvah? What does it mean? What does it mean to be Jewish without having a bat mitzvah? What does it mean to be Jewish with having a bat mitzvah? And just really explore and kind of giving myself the permission today to be Jewish the way that I am and not look at my past and use this ceremony that I didn't have when I was 13 as the thing that would have made me Jewish. I'm Jewish today because I am. Okay, great. Thank you. Primrose. My book is Lessons in Fusion. It's about a 16-year-old food blogger who is Filipinx and Ashkenazi Jew. She enters a televised cooking competition where the producers only want her to cook Filipino food instead of her baba's recipes. She knows nothing about the Filipino culture, so she has to learn not only to cook the cuisine, but learn more about her culture. And as she does so, she learns about her identity, her food, her family, and why her mother kept it all from her in the first place. The reason why I wrote this book is during the pandemic in 2020, my son and I actually got into an argument because he refused to read. He was extremely stressed out. He was extremely anxious because he was isolated. He didn't have his friends and he retreated into video games and YouTube videos. And that upset me greatly. My son is also Ashkenazi Jew and Philippine X. I'm, I'm a Jew by choice. So my children have been raised in both worlds. I asked him, why aren't you reading? And he said to me, well, I don't want to read the books that we have. And he had a stack of books next to his bed. All the books, first of all, were about dystopian stories. He was 12 at the time. That's all the stories that were out there. He didn't want to read about that right in the middle of the pandemic. And the second thing he said is that none of these characters relate to me. And I looked at them and I thought to myself, you're right. None of these characters in any of these books are anyone that you could relate to. So if I write a book for you, about you, will you read it? And he said, yes. And together we came up with the basis of the story and I wrote the book. Wow, that's fascinating that your son actually helped you come up with it. Yeah, it was really born out of the fact that we were watching so many cooking competitions on Netflix and just on TV because there was really nothing much to watch. There was no new television stories. So this was something we kind of got obsessed with. And I thought, well, let's work with this and 
together as we talked about it, he actually helped me realize that it actually worked better. We said it during the pandemic. The entire television competition actually takes place through Zoom. And that was his idea. And it really, really helped because it grounded the character so that she would have her support system with her rather than her being distant from them in Toronto filming a cooking competition. And as we talked more, he helped me develop the characters' voices. Uh, eventually got bored of that because he went back to school, but I just kept going and really dived into this character and created something that wasn't just for him, but for anybody who had a foot in both worlds. Wonderful. Thank you. So you've each written a story about characters who are struggling to define their identity in the face of judgment from other people, even including family members. I'm really noticing a, a current throughout all of these books of people wanting to tell other people what their identity should be. And I just wonder why, I mean, obviously you're not going to know the answer to this. This is a big philosophical question, but just... I'm just wondering, why do you think people have such a strong urge to define each other? Do you have any thoughts on, on why we do that to each other? Oh, I, I, have, I have a lot of thoughts about it. <laughs> and well, I, I, I'm going to gather my thoughts. <laughs> Someone else should go first. Sure. In my book, the main character, Sarah, the producers are constantly calling her Sarah. They just don't seem to understand this is how she wants her name to be pronounced. And she gives in because she's trying to now squeeze herself into this box that the producers want to put her in. She has to find her voice and try to say, no, this is who I am. This is actually a message I try to teach my children. Don't let other people define you. Be yourself. Mm -hmm. I kind of wish people would stop trying to define other people. I wish people would let people be who they are. But, but I also think that the desire to define others stems from a desire to define yourself. I think that people want there to be rules because you can understand rules. Like if you can find the rules to a system, then you can find where you fit into the system. And I think that when you do that, in order to come up with a consistent set of rules, sometimes you end up defining others in the process. But I think as you get older, you sort of realize that these rules don't really exist you don't need to fit into these isolated boxes and you can be whoever you want, which means that everyone else can be whoever they want. But then I think some people never quite grow out of that. Like the grandmother in my book and like some real life grandmothers mm -hmm. kind of see themselves as the gatekeepers. Like the grandmother in my book, she thinks that she is in the right. She looks at the rules and she's like, okay, the rules I grew up with say that if your mother is not Jewish and you didn't convert, then you are not Jewish. Therefore, you are not Jewish, no matter you know what the rules of your reform synagogue say and no matter how you feel and no matter how you were raised. And so I do think some people just like being gatekeepers and keeping people out of the group, too. I think that's so true. And I think that comes from kind of an insecurity within themselves where like if the rules that they learned no longer exist then their entire foundation of who they are suddenly disappears too. And so because they've only defined themselves against these rules, they kind of need to cling to them or else like the fundamental foundation of who they are is suddenly gone. Because that's part of what they interpret themselves to be. Mm -hmm. When people are like that and they're fixed in their own ways, that's the, their way, I suppose, of saying that's who they are. And I think that's something that everyone needs to learn that when one person is a certain way and a certain personality and a certain person, that doesn't affect who you are. They don't have to bleed into each other. Everyone can be themselves. In Recipe for Disaster and in The Two Wrong Halves of Ruby Taylor, the characters are struggling with feeling Jewish enough. And in Lessons in Fusion, Sarah is comfortable with her Jewishness, but she's struggling with feeling Filipino enough. So do you think that every mixed heritage child is destined to go through this process of figuring out how to feel like enough? And do you have any advice about getting through it? These are good questions. My gosh, so thought provoking. <laughs> no, I feel like I can't speak for every mixed heritage child. I would say that the ones I know have kind of gone through this journey of feeling like they don't quite belong on either side. But again, those are all anecdotal experiences. Yeah, I, I really hope that every child from a mixed heritage is not destined to go through this. 
Like my husband was raised Greek Orthodox and I have my own blend. And I really want our children to know that they're both and like to feel very comfortable being both. And I know that's maybe hopelessly naive and optimistic, but I would really like for them not to struggle the same way that I did. It can potentially be very complicated, but I feel like creating an open dialogue about it and sort of making it a thing that people are allowed to talk about and think about it and maybe even change how they feel about it over time makes it so much easier. I think if you're mixed heritage, you're not going to live your life 50%, 50%. It's just life isn't like that. There's no black and white and everything blends together. And sometimes you go one way and sometimes you go another. With our children, we try so, so hard to raise them with both sides. And we try to do it equally, but we know there's no such thing. We're trying to raise them with the Jewish culture and the Jewish religion. Like we actually go to synagogue We're pre-pandemic when they actually had a family service. Like my family and my children were so in involved with the synagogue and my oldest son actually had a puppet show like he, he had a puppet character that he did during the family service and it was very well known and everyone loved this character then the pandemic happened and we went to online services and my kids lost touch and we're trying to bring that back but they went to a hebrew bilingual school and at the same time we took them to folk dance lessons and they performed in Filipino folk dance festivals in the summertime. And so we try to balance both, but there's going to be disconnect. My parents celebrate Christmas and my cousins celebrate Christmas. And my kids have to be very careful when my cousins talk about Santa Claus. And when my parents decide to have Easter dinner, invite us and they have a big old ham in the center of the table. We don't keep kosher at all, but it almost falls during Passover, and that's the time we don't eat ham. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but there's these disconnects, and we had to raise my children to speak up how they feel about it. It's a constant battle of trying to balance both worlds, and it'll shift in one direction or the other. All right. Cooking and baking plays a role to a greater or lesser extent in all of your stories, so I'd like to ask each of you to talk about the role of cooking in your story and why this theme is important to you. So, I mean, I think cooking and baking is important to me in relation to my Jewishness because it's a lot of how I feel Jewish in my life because I'm not super observant. I haven't been to synagogue, you know, since the high holidays, but I do like to bake challah and bake babka and like try all sorts of new flavor combinations in my babka, some that are more successful than others. French onion babka is delicious. Oh, yum. Oh. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> Ow. and so I think it always ends up playing kind of the same role for my characters. Although actually, it's kind of the opposite in the two wrong halves of Ruby Taylor, which is not usually how it is in my books, where cooking helps them feel connected to their heritage. But in the book, the grandmother owns like a catering business where she cooks kosher food and Ruby's cousin, Sarah, who is the overly perfect one, is always asked to help out. And meanwhile, Ruby always just messes everything up. The opening scene of the book is actually Ruby dropping a big container of the grandmother's matzo balls down the stairs. So I think in this book, it really symbolizes how she doesn't feel like she belongs. You know, in her mind, she should be able to like cook these matzo balls. She should be able to help with the cooking of this kosher food. And because her family doesn't keep kosher and because she sees herself as so unsuccessful in helping with all of the cooking and the baking, it just contributes to the feeling of her not belonging. And so she has to kind of come to the realization that that's not her way of fitting into her culture. She has other ways of fitting in and feeling part of the Jewish people than, you know, being able to successfully carry the matzo balls up the stairs. And now I really want matzo ball soup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like food is such an integral part of Judaism. At least it is in my version of Judaism. Like the times I feel the most Jewish are around very specific dinner tables. The Passover Seder table or the break fast dinner table. When I thought of the idea of Recipe for Disaster, I kind of backed into it because I knew I wanted to write about food and I wanted to write a book where recipes were treated as poems and I can't think about food without thinking of the most important food to me, which is the food that my family has every year at Passover, or the latkes we make at Hanukkah, or the hamantashen we make at Purim. Food and Judaism are so 
intricately linked for me. It was impossible to write a book about food without it also being about Judaism. I agree. Food is so important to Judaism and almost all cultures. I've always thought of food as a gateway to culture almost. Yeah. The first thing you think of when you think of any culture is a cuisine. In my novel, Lessons in Fusion, I actually have recipes at the beginning of each chapter and they are formatted like a food blog because Sarah is a food blogger. And I also kind of backed into the story through wanting to have recipes in the book. And when we started to put together this story about this cooking competition, I started to create these fusion recipes. And for those who don't know what fusion is, it's basically taking two types of cuisine and trying to intertwine them together into one dish. And I love that as a metaphor for Sarah, who is Ashkenazi Jew and Philippine X. And so I really wanted her to realize that when she was asked, cook Filipino food for us. And the only thing that she had in her repertoire, really, were these beautiful memories of her cooking with her Bubba. And she couldn't share that in this competition. So she had to kind of push that aside. And then she had to learn to cook Filipino food and realize she only knew three dishes. And by realizing she knew nothing about the food, she knew nothing about that side of her culture. And so she dove into learning about culture through food and eventually learned how to integrate both sides of her cultures, not only into herself and into her life, but also into her cooking. And that was so important to me to incorporate those two halves and this gorgeous metaphor of food on a plate and putting it together. We're raising our children this way, trying to put these two cultures together on a plate and in a child. So th I was just fascinated with that as a metaphor for my story. I love that as a metaphor. I think that's great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and now that we've made the listeners hungry, <laughs> um, <laughs> is there any particular dish or a recipe that was in your story that you would like to recommend that people should seek out and, and try? I have a really fantastic recipe for brisket caldereta in the book. It was one of the first recipes I thought of to put together because caldereta is a Filipino stew, beef stew, with olives and peppers, and it's, it's very briny. And there's brisket. And our Bubba's recipe for brisket was onion soup mix and brown sugar and a lot of salt and put that into an oven forever. And I thought, what if I combined both? And the first time I tried it was so succulent, so divine. I actually wanted to serve it for one of the satyrs. I was turned down, but <laughs> I, I would love to do that one day, someday when I get to govern the satyr and I get to be the primary cook rather than my mother-in-law. She cooks incredibly, so I, I, I'm not going to take that away from her. But one day, one day I'm going to cook that for a satyr. Awesome. I think my favorite recipe that I included in the book is probably the one for sufganyot. I love to make soup gun yolk because I, I love donuts, but um, I'm very picky about them. Like I want them to be warm. I like them to be cream filled, which I know is not technically soup gun yolk, but I like them with cream and not jelly. And so I very much recommend that it has become my go-to for Hanukkah because like we were definitely like a latke family. And then I was started researching for this book and I was like, oh, let me try the soup gun yolk recipe. And it was so good. And so now the last, I think like three or four Hanukkahs, we've done the soup gun oh, yolk. I gotta try that. I was going to say, if you have a recipe for like a Passover dessert that tastes good, definitely want that. <laughs> I have those too. The flourless chocolate cake that we have had since I was 13 or 14. I don't have it in the book, but... I have a very good flour with a chocolate cake recipe if you'd like it. I could always go for a chocolate cake recipe. Uh, it's so good that it doesn't even need to be Passover. It's just like any excuse to me. It's so rich because <laughs> there's no flour. It's like just chocolate. It's delicious. Well, I'm just a sucker for matzo bread during Passover and we make it every day. But what I add to it, and I've always added to it, and I put that as a recipe in my book, is that I do avocado, mango, and condensed milk Ooh. Ooh. on top. Mm. That sounds good. Those flavors are very Filipino. And I thought, I'm going to put that together with the, uh, the matzo bread and chef's kiss. So good. That sounds amazing. <laughs> I bet that would be good on like a latka too. It probably would. Oh, yeah. I put that in everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. So I know, Amanda, your book isn't quite as heavily cooking related as the other two titles we're talking about here. But did you have any particular dish that you wanted to recommend? 
Most of the scenes in the book that involve food are unhappy about it. But there is a scene where they have the Hanukkah party and it features all of the Hanukkah food. And even though the scene itself might not be that happy, I feel like the associations of the food are happy. So I guess like vodkas with sour cream and applesauce, I sit on the fence, but I I guess I'd have to go with that. Um, Unless I can go with a recipe that's not in the book, in which case I'd go with my French onion babka because that is really delicious. You just sent me the recipe for that. We'll have to trade. I I want to try that. I want that too. <laughs> also, I always thought I was like an applesauce latke person, but then not during Hanukkah. I had them with sour cream and they were so good, but I'm still like an applesauce during a Hanukkah person. But all the rest of the year, I do sour cream. In my book, I actually have one of the first recipes, a sweet potato latke but with Indian seasonings, and mm. she makes it with like yogurt, that sounds good. yogurt, green apple, and cucumber reta. So like yogurt, and put that instead. And when I finally nailed down the recipe, because I tend to just make up recipes when I cook. So actually, when I nailed it down, oh my gosh, oh, it turned out so, so well. Good. Sounds so good. I like a parsnip <laughs> latke with cranberry sauce, like a little Ooh. horseradish in the cranberry sauce. A very good combination. Parsnips. What a great idea. Brilliant. <laughs> to be fair, it wasn't my idea. I got the recipe from Smitten Kitchen, but they were delicious. <laughs> <Love that. laughs> I'm like going to find a way to make matzo ball soup tonight or, or order it or something because I'm really craving it now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's move on. Um, the granddaddy of interfaith kidlet, or maybe it should be the grandmama, of Interfaith Kidlet is Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret by Judy Bloom, And it's coming out as a movie after all these years. When it was published in 1970, it was a very rare example of an interfaith book. But now it's common, as with your books, it's common to see both casual and in-depth explorations of this identity. Why do you think it took so long for that to happen? I feel like there is a real want just in general not even just children but for people to see jewish characters that aren't just framed as victims and they want to see jewish characters that are like them like in their own worlds and the interfaith example is such a perfect perfect framing for that because i've had many filipinos read my book who know nothing about jewish people other than the Holocaust and all the stereotypes, unfortunately. But they read my book and like, oh, I get it. Because I have the mother's story, her conversion story as part of the book, just to show that it's not a rejection of religion and rejection of culture. It's an embracing of something else. I think just right now, especially, it's just a time for people to want to see those stories more and embrace those stories more because people are so much more... Uh, conscious of the media they're consuming and of the stories they want to read. Everyone wants to see diversity and they want to see different stories. I also wonder if it's taken time for Judaism itself to evolve to a place where it can handle these sorts of conversations. Because I like I, I wasn't alive in the 70s. I was born in 1990, but I was not privy to these kinds of conversations until much later in my life. And I don't know if it's social media or if it's just the people that I personally associate with or if it's just my own awareness of things. But I feel like some of these conversations or at least like the openness around the conversation and the acceptingness of the conversations is newish. And so 50 years ago, when Are You There, Goddess Me, Margaret came out, that might have been the first time some people were ever even thinking about what it meant to be interfaith. In that way, like, I'm very grateful that the book existed when it did, because if, if that really was people's first time thinking about it, then it clearly needed to be talked about. And I feel like that maybe started the conversation in some ways. And, you know, here we are 50 years later talking about it so much more freely and so much more comfortably. Hopefully it continues. All right. Since we are all here together, do you have any questions for each other? I, I'd love to know if everyone is writing books that are quote unquote Jewish, something that you intentionally choose to do, or is it something that just sort of happens naturally for you? My first book came out in 2015, and it started off being something that I kind of threw in 
just because I was Jewish. And so the main character was Jewish. And then I actually got some pushback from my publisher because I, I had something about like she spent all of her bat mitzvah money on something. And my publisher came back and was like, I don't know if people are going to really know what a bat mitzvah is. Can we change this? And I was just sitting there like, well, if it was like she spent all of her Easter money on something, you wouldn't ask me to change that. And so after that, it kind of became something that I included in my books, just kind of out of spite. Um, so I feel like that's a, like, you know, a very powerful motivation. And so, yeah, my books kind of became more and more Jewish since then. And I've had a lot of fun with it. I think someone already mentioned that a lot of the books when we were younger and growing up were sad Jewish books, like Holocaust related a lot of victims. And so I had a lot of fun writing funny books about Jewish kids where they got to be the heroes in the end and nobody died horribly. I like that. Lessons in Fusion is my first novel. Prior to that, I actually have a long history of being a playwright. And my plays have always been about identity in some form. I've written a lot about Filipino identity, identity as a mother, identity as a woman. And I started started to, of course, write about being Jewish as well. My most recent play that I'm currently working on and finishing, Precipice, is about a Philippine ex-woman who has converted to Judaism and trying to reconcile that with her very, very strongly Catholic, very Filipino mother. Both stories kind of go hand in hand. I wrote them both at the same time. So I feel like the play is almost... Sarah's mother's story. I write about what I know, and I wanted to write about my Jewish side as well, and not just about my Filipino side, because I wanted my children and my audience to see stories of Judaism that aren't just about the Holocaust, and also about interfaith, interreligious, intercultural stories that showed diversity. Uh, and I was actually very lucky, I'm going to plug myself, that uh, my play Precipice actually won the Canadian Jewish Playwriting Competition. That's so tough. Thank you. And it, I think that it shows that people want to read these stories. And so I want to explore them further. Amy, can you answer the question that you asked so we can hear what you have to say about it? Well, I think the reason that I asked is because for me, it's very conscious when I make my stories Jewish because I was not raised in any particularly Jewish way. When I write my books, I try to go back to when I was that age and sort of live the experience, I guess. And because I really did not have many markers of Judaism at that point in my life, it tends to not come out in my stories unless I put it there. I'm always just curious what it's like for other people. Because for people who were raised in very Jewish households, you can't not write it. Because when you're going back to your 12-year-old self, the Judaism is there. Okay. Did anybody else have a question for the rest of the group? What are your next projects? Yeah, actually, that was something I wanted to ask, too. I want to know what everybody's working on next. As of right now, I have three books coming out in 2024. Wow. One of which is a Jewish chapter book, one of which is a picture book called Pasta, Pasta, Lots of Pasta, and one of which is a middle grade that is not Jewish called Words Apart. But the scheduling is possibly going to get shifted around. But as of this moment, three books in 2024, which I'm very excited for. Mazel tov on that. Thank you. I think there's a good chance that one of them is going to end up in 2025. But we'll see. Okay. Good work, Amy. <laughs> it's funny because so many of these we sold like mm -hmm. ages and ages ago. And it just happens to be that because publishing is chaotic, that they just happen to be stacked one right. one after the other. Okay, and Primrose, you mentioned that you're working on a play, and is there anything else that you're working on? Well, I'm finishing that play, Precipice, and I'm going to approach my, my publisher to start the next story. I just have to finish promoting this one. I'm toying with the idea of writing a story about my mother who had gone to Holland from the Philippines to sew. She was young at the time. She was about 18 years old. And I'm going to toy with the idea of a story about her lying about her age. Because she said a lot of the girls had done that in order to go to Holland to sew. I'm fascinated with that story. And I was actually going to take one of my plays and adapt that to a novel. But my mother and her friends, like this group that had gone to Holland, are getting older. And I think I need to write this story sooner rather than later. But I really want to explore that next. Interesting. Amanda, how about you? 
So I actually just had an adult book come out. It's called Best Served Hot, an adult romance under the name Amanda Elliott. And that is actually a lot more food focused. Congratulations. Those are all so exciting. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So it's Tikkun Olam time. I want to ask each of you what action you would like to call listeners to take to help heal the world. Amanda, go ahead. So I came with both an organization and an action. I like to donate and follow the Malala Fund, which funds girls' education around the world. It's been a very good way to lift girls out of poverty and people out of poverty is through education. And as far as action, it's kind of vague, but I guess do something every day to leave the world a little bit better than it was before. Holding the door for someone, just like anything that puts more good into the world than there was before, I think is worthy. Okay, very nice. Uh, Amy? So the organization that I wanted to highlight is an organization that has helped me so much over the last couple of years with discovering who I am as a Jewish person, as well as specifically helping me write Recipe for Disaster. And that is the group Judaism Unbound. They're a group that supports a grassroots efforts specifically by disaffected American Jews to help them redesign and reimagine what their Jewish life can look like. They have a weekly podcast, which I've been on a couple times, which is also called Judaism Unbound. And I think for me, it's really given me a sense of sort of permission that, that I do, in fact, belong in the Jewish community and that this is a place where I fit in and that it can mean whatever it means to me because I'm the one that gets to define my Judaism. They also have a really cool program called On Yeshiva, which is like a digital center for Jewish learning. It's open to anybody who wants to dig deeper. So the action is to check them out. I think they are spectacular and they've done just so much great work for me personally, as well as for so many other people in the world. So I really want to pay it forward because they're the reason that I have the book that I'm here. I owe a lot to them. Excellent. Primrose. With my book being so centered around food, I also have a food blog, Peg on a Plate on Instagram. Food is an important part of my life, my family's life, and especially recently because I've been doing a lot of cooking demonstrations. So food has become part of my persona. I am privileged to be able to afford good food and healthy food and to be able to cook food regularly. So I encourage everyone to support your local food bank. Donate money, donate food, whatever you can, because when people cannot eat and they have that insecurity around food, they cannot live. That is a right to have food. It shouldn't be a privilege. So it's very important to me and my family that we put money aside to ensure that we can provide food for people who don't have it. Excellent. Is there anything else that anybody would like to talk about that I haven't thought to ask you? I feel like I feel like we got really deep into some really important things. Yeah. <laughs> well, good. So let's tell where people can learn more about your work. So we heard Peg on a Plate is Primrose's food blog. Do you have any other online presence that you want us to know about Primrose? Primrose MK on Instagram. And that will actually have more information about my upcoming gigs and podcasts and other writing events that are coming up. Okay. Amanda, how about you? I am Amanda Panich, P-A-N-I-T-C-H on Instagram. And I'm also amandapanich.com. I have a newsletter. I send it out once a month or once every other month where you can learn about upcoming books or events or other things going on. Okay. And Amy? I am Amy Lucido, A-I-M-E-E-L-U-C-I-D-O on Twitter and Instagram. That's a good way to follow me. And then also my website, amylucido.com. So any, uh, I'm also very Googleable. I'm the only Amy Lucido in the world as far as, as far as I know. My first name is French. My last name is Italian. And so it is a strange combo. And <laughs> it's very easy to find me if you if you know how to spell my name. All right, perfect. Amy Lucido, Amanda Panich, Primrose Medeg Nason. Thank you so much for speaking with me. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. All right. Wonderful. Hi, this is Susan Lynn Meyer, author of A Sky Full of Song. I'll be joining you soon on the Book of Life podcast. I'd like to dedicate my episode to all the Jewish kids who are fascinated by the Little House on the Prairie series.
say hi to Heidi at 561-206-2473 or bookoflifepodcast at gmail.com. Check out our Book of Life podcast Facebook page or our Facebook discussion group, Jewish Kidlit Mavens. We are occasionally on Twitter, too, at Book of Life Pod. Want to read the books featured on the show? Buy them through bookshop.org slash shop slash book of life to support the podcast and independent bookstores at the same time. You can also help us out by becoming a monthly supporter through Patreon. Additional support comes from the Association of Jewish Libraries, which also sponsors our sister podcast, Nice Jewish Books, a show about Jewish fiction for adults. You'll find links for all of that and more at bookoflifepodcast.com. Our background music is provided by the Freilach Makers Klezmer String Band. Thanks for listening, and happy reading! What if David and Goliath were actually lovers and con artists? What if the Scots turned out to be God's chosen people? What if Ilan Ramon had been on the Columbia ground crew instead of on the shuttle? Andrea Lobel and Mark Scheinblum collect an intriguing collection of what-ifs in Jewish history and modern midrash, or Jewish fan fiction of the Bible. I had a fascinating conversation with the editors and two of the collection's authors, Esther Alter and Eric Choi. Join me for this conversation at jewishlibraries.org slash nice jewish books.